There are three levers that we can pull to give you more cash and more profit in your business. It's streamlining expenses uh, as a percentage of revenue. So really diving in and understanding what are you spending your money on and is it within range? So first we look at expenses. We go through every single ex expense and do an audit to make sure the expense is giving you the ROI that you need. The other lever that we look at is top line revenue. So you either can increase your prices, uh, increase your volume, or create more offers. So then we kind of look at the combination of those three. Justin Green is the founder of Assist FP, a financial planning firm, and Be a Wealthy Coach LLC, an outsourced CFO service. All opinions expressed in this episode are mine solely and not reflective of Assist FP or Be a Wealthy Coach. As always, this podcast is not advice and it is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Always consult with your own financial tax and or legal advisor before making any decisions. Thanks so much for joining us, Lauren. Let everyone know, where are you calling in from? I'm in San Diego, California. Oh, nice. I've never actually been. I've heard amazing things. I know there's a really big uh, fitness community out there and uh, just a, a big entrepreneur community out there. So yes. why don't you introduce yourself, Lauren, to the audience, let everyone know who you are, what you do, who you work with, and we'll go from there. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Um, hi, my name is Lauren. I own and founded Active Core Consulting. We are an agency geared for the boutique fitness industry. So my role in the company is the fractional CFO. I'm uh, probably like, what does that mean? <laughs> so fractional CFO, um, if you are a business owner and you are curious about how do the numbers of my business empower the decisions I should be making in my business, then hiring a fractional CFO or somebody with a finance business background um, will really help you get clarity on that. Um, and so what we do with our clients is we have a finance and bookkeeping team that will take over your QuickBooks, um, make sure you get a P&L that actually tells you the story of your business so you can understand what's going on. Um, and then we pair that with uh, financial projections with monthly goals to help you stay on track to whatever goals you want to hit. And then uh, monthly, we do coaching with accountability strategy to help you hit the goals that we um, agreed on. And then we also have an arm of our business that does sales and operations coaching um, that really gets nitty gritty in your sales process, your lead generation process. How are you converting your intro offers into memberships for our fitness studios um, and really just helping you through every step of the way. So first step, let's get you a business plan that makes sense and actually uh, make sure you're profitable. And then step two, let's coach you and help you to make sure you're hitting the goals that we identified. Yeah, just having a business plan, it's like a really good first step. I, I've I've run into so many uh, business owners who, while they might be making good money, don't even have a plan. <laughs> like, they, yeah, you know, they've never yeah. even taken the time to consider the strategy and the messaging and you know, leads and where they're coming from, et cetera. And so just having a plan itself is a really good place to start. What do yeah. you feel and like? What is we one found the... is like when um, you don't have a plan, and especially if you're in that middle range where you're seeing some success, but not as much success as you want to see, what we find is that studio or business owners will, that saying, throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. So we're just trying all these different things rather than being strategic and like really honing into what is the strategy that's actually going to get you there and making sure our decisions are flown through the model. So if we're going to make a change in the business, it's a calculated change. So we know what the impact is going to be, but hopefully before we make that decision. Yeah. And to your point, like throwing spaghetti at the wall sometimes is like an okay strategy, but if you don't have the numbers to tell you like what's working and what's sticking, um, mm -hmm. then it's, it's like, you know, it's kind of a double whammy there when that's your strategy, but then you also don't have the numbers in place and the data to, to kind of show you like, Oh, okay, this is working or this isn't working. Like, I think mm -hmm. experimentation is a huge part of, of being a business owner, but you need to have the information available on the back end to show you like, okay, like this scorecard says like the results like are in, like it's working or it's not right. And then being able to make decision based off of that data. That's where I think the CFO role is so huge. And so many people, uh, they get into business because they like coaching. They like, you know, teaching. 
I know you work with all sorts of different like boutique, you know, fitness studios, but like they'd like to teach whatever format of fitness or health that they like. Um, but they don't really care for the numbers. They don't really care for the business side of it. And so I think that's, yeah. that's huge. Now I've also seen you talk a lot about like money mindset. And so I, I'd love to dive into that with you a little bit and, uh, just kind of see like, what do you think is like holding back a lot of these business owners? Yeah, it's a good question. And the way that we coach this is I always say, I can give you all the strategies you need to run your business. I can give you a beautiful business plan with the offers and the pricing and the team pay and everything that you need to be successful. But if um, if you don't have a good money mindset, if you are not aware of where your subconscious beliefs that are holding you back, specifically around money are coming from, you're kind of just going to keep running into like a brick wall, sort of speak. So um, we like to also work on your money beliefs and your money mindset, which means like, how do you think about money? Um, so I believe that money doesn't just exist in your bank account. It shows up everywhere in your life. It shows up in your relationships and your self-worth, your career, your business, your spirituality, your life decisions. And so learning the impact that money has on the way that you think about life is an incredibly empowering process and it'll ripple through your life day in and day out. Are you familiar with the concept of money scripts by Brad Klontz? No, I haven't, but I'm going to write that down because I... Yeah, you should check exciting. it out because um, it, it sounds like you would really enjoy diving into like that research and in the literature that his, uh, Brad Klontz and his father, Ted Klontz, both PhDs in financial therapy, I believe, have a lot of information out around kind of how money and growing up with money and, and what you experience has impacted and shaped your beliefs around money. And there's four core money scripts, um, money vigilance, money avoidance, money status. And I'm blanking on the fourth one, but they're, they're very interesting. I think you would enjoy looking into them, but essentially it's how you grew up with money and how it shapes who you are now with money. And one of the things that I find the most interesting is that you can have two different people who both say grow up poor and it can lead to two completely different outcomes, right? Like one can be really greedy exactly. and chasing wealth and like at all costs, like make a lot of like poor life decisions at the expense of just wanting more money. And then you can have the total opposite people who are like extremely frugal and in it and unable to invest in themselves and make like proper investments in the business, et cetera. And so it's really interesting to, to kind of learn about that and understand like getting to the bottom of why are you the way you are around money? Um, so I, I think you, you should check that out for sure. I will. Thank you. And one of my first uh, money coaches that I had years ago that helped me in my, the initial dive into my money uh history she always said money is never the issue your thoughts about money are the issue so exactly what you said like you could have two people that have the same upbringing and that could affect how they think about money for the rest of their life yeah absolutely money is simply a tool right so like people you know it's not good or bad it's just it's just a tool to kind of help you you know live the life that you want to live so if you want to live a bad life it'll help you do that if you want to live a good life it'll help right, you do that right. um it's simply the tool that allows you to do that do you walk through like every client do they go through some type of like money mindset exercise do you have any clients who push back and are like whoa this is a little like too woo woo for me or yeah that's a good question so we started doing this in our group coaching program um, and so our, our second round is going to be in January. And the first two weeks are all around money mindset and limiting beliefs. Um, because a lot of business owners that are in this group coaching program uh, don't have a ton of experience in finances or doing anything like we do in the program, like we help them create uh, their projections. We look at their offers. We look at their pricing. We look how about how much money it takes for you to live the life that you want to live. So both in your business and personal. And what I found is if we don't do this work before diving into like the strategy, um, people have a lot of blocks and they get a bit fearful around putting numbers on a spreadsheet. Um, and so trying to help them 
understand where these limiting beliefs and this fear around money came from initially helps them move through the program with a little bit more ease. We're not going to solve all your problems in two weeks, but um, it's a good kind of like like pulling off the first layer of the onion to understand where these come from. Gotcha. Uh, you just mentioned it, and I, I've seen you talk about this before, and I actually want to dive into this a little bit with you. Uh, I think you call it like your your owner's comp um, roadmap. Is, is that, yes. Is that yeah, owner's pay yeah. roadmap. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, owner's pay roadmap. And I think this is so important. I talk about this a lot, so I'd love to dive into this with you. But yeah, taking the time, and this is we overlap a little bit in this, in this sense, right? Because it's personal and business finances. But I find that so many business owners don't take the time to figure out what their actual living expenses are and what they need. I call it like figuring out your baseline expenses, what you actually need to just like live your life with no luxuries, right? So, you know, if you're familiar with an emergency fund, people say like, you know, your bare minimum expenses, that's what we're looking at. Because I kind of think of this in terms of like a pyramid of like at the bottom or like a ladder at the bottom, like you have to you have to hit that number first. Like, I don't think you can make a lot of monetary investments into your business until you've hit that baseline revenue amount. And I feel like so many people don't actually know what it is they need to make to live their basic life. And then like, okay, their life plus some entertainment and then their life plus some goals. And and then, you know, keep going to their dream life. So Tell me more about that framework that you have and, and how that works. Yeah, it's very similar to what you um, what you described. We break out um, a couple buckets of expenses. So really using almost like a profit first concept. Um, mm-hmm. But I like to think of it as like compartmentalizing your money. Because if we have all of our money in one account, it's kind of like going to a Las Vegas buffet and just like loading up on all the food, and then you eat everything and you're so full and miserable. So like, in my opinion, if you have all of your money in one account, you don't know what it's for. Uh, So we do separate bank accounts. So I like to have two different checking accounts, one for your bills, and those are all your repeatable expenses every single month. So your mortgage, your rent, your utilities, um, if you have like, you know, childcare, uh, car loan payment, anything that's pretty fixed and repeatable every single month, we put in the, the bills total. So let's say that's $4,000. At the beginning of each month, you can um, put $4,000 in that account and not have to worry about anything because we know, okay, we need $4,000 to pay all these bills. $4,000 goes in throughout the month. It goes out. It's like out of sight, out of mind. And then the next bucket is our habits. So the variable expenses that happen every month, so gas, groceries, uh, uh, you know, bare minimum, um, entertainment, concerts, movies, whatever you like to do, you get acupuncture, chiropractor, like whatever those expenses are for you. Um, and I also like to teach people, right, going off what you said, like what are your baseline expenses that you have to have and what are the nice to have? So we'll break out in two buckets so we can understand a what's a luxury for ourselves versus what we have to have. Um, and then I like to look at short term savings. So what are things that you need to save for in the next 12 months? Um, obviously, well, yes, not obviously, but in this bucket, I like to put the emergency savings in. So three to six months of those baseline expenses. Um, and then it's really just dependent on what the person's goal is. So for me, for the past couple of years, I had a short-term savings around a car payment or saving for a car because I knew I had to buy a new car. Um, I ended up getting in an accident earlier this year. So like, thank God I had this account because I had 15, I think it had 15 or $17,000 in it already. Um, the car was about 30. So thankfully we are entrepreneurs and we can create money on the fly. So I just called in a couple more clients uh, on a project basis and got $10,000 and was able to pay for this car. So that was like a really big relief. I didn't have to have a car payment and I can just pay this in cash uh, and not worry about increasing my monthly bills. I'm trying to keep that um, as streamlined as possible. But other clients, you know, they want to remodel their house. I just had a call yesterday with a client. She wants to build an ADU. Her daughter's going to college. So she's saving for those expenses. And then we have long-term investments. Um, And here is where I say, like, I'm not a financial planner, but I want to help you identify how much money 
you have in your plan that we can put in a long-term savings. And then let's work with a financial planner who can do long-term investments and long-term savings and retirement. So this process is more about figuring out the money in the buckets. And then from a long-term, you know, working with somebody like you uh, or whoever they, you know, reside with on the financial planning side. You could just say working with me. I mean, we don't working have, with you. Like, yeah. Going all, yeah. All the options. <laughs> I mean, no, um, you know, that's, that's a good, a good explanation of kind of the cutoff. There's some overlap there. I would say it really depends who the financial planner is. Some financial planners will go deep into the cash flow, kind of like you're talking about, um, which I, I tend to do because I work with a lot of solopreneurs and business owners. It's like to ignore the cash flow would just be. I'd be like skipping a huge step and a lot of them mm-hmm. haven't worked with someone like you. So they don't have that foundation. But if someone was like coming to me who had worked with you, it's like, okay, cool. We've got like a really solid foundation. We can, we yeah. can just kind of table that, which is awesome. Uh, Cause those are really hard conversations. Those are not the easiest, right? Cause like you and I might come at it from here's the numbers, but the client themselves has a hard time like disassociating emotion and numbers with their spending, I find. And so those can be really tough conversations around like you're overspending or you're, you know, you need to make more money because the way you want to live your life, there's not enough money here to support that. Um, And so those can be really tough conversations to have. Yeah, it it is tough. And I think they're just like, they're necessary. And if somebody like you and I aren't going to have them with the client, hopefully they have somebody else. But I, I always think if it's not us, then who? Uh, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. No one. And then on the, the <laughs> opposite, yeah, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> on the opposite end of that spectrum, a couple of women who went through my program over the summer, they were like very fearful. Um, they had been divorced in the past couple of years, which I think mm-hmm. this story resides a, a, a lot with you know, divorced women, unfortunately, where their husband was either the main breadwinner or the one that took care of the finances. So now they're off on their own and they have their business, you know, they're doing their thing, but they just like, they just don't know. They're just like fearful. Like, I don't know how much money I need to live my life. I'm kind of scared to spend it. I don't know how much money I should be making in my business. So doing this process was really empowering for them. And one woman at the end of the owner's pay roadmap module, she was like, oh, I'm fine. I don't have to be fearful anymore. Like how amazing is that feeling to have? So it it also, I think for some people can be a really like good clarity into where they are. And sometimes it's better than what they think, or at least it's clarity. It's like, okay, these are the goals I know I need to hit. Now, when we do the next module around pricing and offers, uh, I know there's a lot of emotions around the owning a business, especially in the fitness industry. There's so many emotions around selling in the fitness industry because it's not a commodity. So it's like a luxury item that all of our clients are paying us. And so when we go into pricing, it's less about us trying to own what our clients' budgets are and we just own what we need to charge in order to live this life that we want to live, which we just figured out through our owner's pay roadmap. Mm. Let's dive into that a little bit more. So that is so good. You don't, don't project. Like, I, I feel like it's like you're projecting your, your budgetary like limitations on the clients. Like don't spend for them. Don't assume mm-hmm. they can't. I'm really bad at this. I do this all the time. Uh, I think, I think we all do it. Stuff. Yeah. 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 Uh, I do it too. Well, let's, just to- let's dive into that a little bit more. So like, don't spend the money for them. Like let them make the decision if right. they can afford it or not. Right. Talk about pricing a little bit more. So you, a lot of boutique fitness studios, I think tend to be higher end pricing. Would I be wrong in saying that? Nope. That's correct. Running a brick and mortar so- is so expensive. Yeah. I've actually heard yeah. that a lot of gyms like are barely profitable if profitable yeah. at all. Yeah, until they work um, so, with us. <laughs> I, like that. I like that. All right. So what do you do to all right, so if they're barely profitable and then they come to you, like what are you doing to help them uh get more profit? Yeah, good question. And this applies to any business owner. So there are three levers that we can pull to give you more cash and more profit in your business. It's streamlining expenses uh, as a percentage of revenue. So really diving in and understanding 
what are you spending your money on? And is it within range? So I've created um, acceptable ranges for different buckets of expenses. Mm -hmm. For example, marketing expense. Uh, if you're spending more than 10% of your revenue on marketing, it's a cause for concern. Maybe it's part of the strategy that we're doing. Okay, we're going to like spend a bunch of money on marketing and that's the point. So we can get more leads in. But if we're just frivolously spending on marketing, and again, to our point earlier, not having the data to back up what we're doing, uh, that could be problematic. Um, payroll, for example, um, I don't. I want payroll to stay around thirty percent of your expenses. Um, and in a brick and mortar fitness studio, uh, that generally is like the sweet spot. But if we're spending more than thirty percent on uh, payroll, we just need to understand why are we being efficient? Are there certain things that we can rearrange to not spend so much money on payroll, for example? So first we look at expenses. Um, we go through every single ex expense and do an audit to make sure the expense is giving you the ROI that you need. Uh, the other lever that we look at is top line revenue. So you either can increase your prices, uh, increase your volume or create more offers. So then we kind of look, we, we look at the combination of those three and look at your pricing to see where your membership pricing is falling at. For a fitness studio, um, I don't want you to have to have more than 200 members to be profitable. So we'll kind of do okay. some analysis around that. I just, a lot of fitness studios need three to 400 members to be profitable. And in the market right now, it's just really, really challenging to get that number of members depending what market you're in a lot of markets especially here in san diego new york city la the big like tier one fitness markets are so oversaturated so you're just competing um, with a lot of other fitness concepts while your concept is unique um you know there's still just a there's just a lot of options these days yeah no that makes sense um all right, so streamline expenses, and mm -hmm. then the second one was pricing. Um, pricing, and then what was the third one? Uh, volume. Volume. Okay, sorry, I thought those were combined. Okay, gotcha. No, that makes a lot of and sense. Um, volume can be literal more members, more customers, or it can be volume of um, the number of offers that we have, so we can get revenue per customer higher. So if you, gotcha. you know, if you're a fitness studio and you have a membership, can you also offer nutrition? Do you have other ancillary revenue offerings? Uh, retail might be a good one with the proper retail strategy. Um, another thing that I'm seeing a lot is studios expanding some unused real estate to add in like an infrared sauna and having mm -hmm. a, you know, an upcharge um, for some sort of recovery room. All right, I'm really going to like throw this at you. I didn't prepare you at all for this. That's okay. Give it what to you. do you, what is like an average after working with you? Um, like what does an average like studio owner actually take home pay? It's a good question. Like, yeah. I have some clients um, that are bringing in six figures between, you know, they have different, ways of bringing in money. So they have their owner salary. They might be teaching some classes each week. And then we do owner distributions. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, I want them to be able to bring home whatever money their owner's pay roadmap shows them. Um, it is a slower build for fitness studios. So I would say a lot of clients. Um, historically, we've done a lot of studio rescue, meaning uh, coming out of the pandemic was obviously a really challenging sure. time for most fitness studios. So a lot of them came to us with a lot of debt, some COVID back rents and all of that, that we had to get them out of. So I would say a majority of like 21, 22 uh, was getting people just like out of the hole, essentially. And so the back yeah. half of 23 and 24 is really where we started seeing um, studio owners like be able to pay themselves which has been really exciting. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess what I was looking for was just like, a, if you were to talk to a studio owner, like, and they were like, oh, I'm taking home X amount. You're like, oh, that's really good. So it sounds like six figures would be like, 
oh, that's like, you're doing really good. You're doing better than most. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would say yeah. so. Even in the like, if, if a studio owner came to me and said, I'm taking home 75K, I'd be like, oh, that's a really good, good place to be. And then we can build from there. Gotcha. What's, gotcha. what's challenging yeah, is when the studio owner is not taking home any money and sure. they're not profitable. Um, how do I say this? If you're not taking home any money from your business, you're going to burn out. Like you need to be able to pay your baseline level of lifestyle and be able to contribute to your life so you're happy and healthy. Because um, if you're not paying yourself, and it's always extenuating circumstances. I have some clients whose husbands um, work full time and they allotted a, a couple number of years for um, our client to build her studio before she needed to take some money sure. home. Um, so there's, you know, it's, it's there's no black and white scenario. Um, but generally, if you're not taking money from your business, that's going to cause stress on you and pressure on your business. So now you're going to make decisions out of fear and scarcity rather than really honing into what your business model is and like what we know is going to work for your business. Um, and then you find that that's the where we're throwing spaghetti off the wall without having the data behind it to really understand what's working and what's not because we're so fearful because we just, we just need more people in because I need to take home a paycheck. Um, so that's where yeah. the money mindset kind of comes into play so we can help calm your nervous system, get you out of that fight or flight space so you can make clear decisions overall i agree with that so much i've because i tend to work with a lot of younger um business owners who are in the online coaching space they're younger they don't have a significant runway they don't have a spouse who's like supporting them for a couple of years so they're actually in the position that you first mentioned of like they need to take money out and they need to live off of it. And so I am, I've said many, many, many times on record saying like, when you launch your number one goal right away is to sprint to the income amount that you need to live off of. You don't yeah. need to hire a coach. You don't need to hire a financial planner, a CFO. You don't need to hire anyone because at early on, all you have is time and you have no money. You need to, yeah. the only thing you need to do is sprint to whatever it is your baseline expenses are, then you can breathe for a minute and like figure out what to do next. But yeah. one of the issues I was running into a lot with online health and fitness coaches is there was a lot of business coaches teaching them to hire what's called an assistant coach. Uh, basically, it just means it's another coach who's taking on their clients or taking on new clients um, at a very early revenue number. So I would get these coaches who would come to me and they wouldn't even be doing... 10k a month which when you run a business 10k a month isn't really 10k a month when you like yeah. back out taxes and expenses and etc and so like this this one coach this one example is in my mind she was doing about she finally started to hit about 7 to 8k consistently and i was like awesome you're like really starting to hit your stride and was getting a lot of pressure to hire an assistant coach and i was like well hold on like pump the brakes like if you hire an assistant coach you still can't pay your personal bills by the time you allot for taxes, et cetera. Like you're not hitting your baseline expenses. And I ran into this so often that I just started getting really loud about it. I was like, okay, until you hit X, Y, and Z, you should be reading books on how to increase your income. You shouldn't be hiring $20,000, you know, group programs to make more money. In my opinion, yeah. like if, if you haven't failed at implementing and executing some free advice for a little while, then you're in no position to like go spend your last dollar on coaching to make more money. Like you need to prove to yourself that you can execute on the free advice. There's so much, there's so much good advice out there that you don't even have to pay for. Right. So for yeah. early people yeah. launching, I'm like, you can read a couple books, you can watch a couple YouTube videos and sprint to your baseline expenses. I think it's so important. Yeah. And to piggyback off of that, especially for uh, the younger entre entrepreneur, especially young as an age, like mm -hmm. you have so much energy in comparison to us over here that are, uh, what, what do they call us? We're old. Geriatric millennials. <laughs> yeah. And so what, what I would say is, um, and this is what I did in my business, um, before I relied on my business to pay my bills, 
I had a bridge job. Well, it was my corporate job. But after I decided I didn't want to do this corporate job anymore, I considered that job a bridge job. Like this job, it's it's just a job. I'm going to put minimal effort that I need to complete the job and make my boss happy and get a paycheck. But I'm, I'm no longer going to go above and beyond for my corporate job mm-hmm. because it's not where my future is. And so if you can have a nest egg before you even make the leap to do your business full time, that would be the, in my opinion, the best way to do this. So whether that's a job, a Brits job, isn't something that you have to be super excited about. It literally just pays your bills. So you have the time and the energy to focus on your business without the pressure of having to make so much money in the beginning while you're learning. Mm-hmm. One of the big things that I did early in my business, because I was so ready to leave my corporate job, is I was like, okay, I'm just going to hustle and figure out my business. I'm going to pay a coach to like teach me what I need to know, and then I'm going to leave. And that was just like a natural disaster. I was like so stressed. Um, it was She was like throwing so much at me. And I was still trying to figure out like, what is my offer? How am I helping people? And then she had all these like marketing tactics, which would have been really supportive if I was in the right place. I was just so early on in my business. Like you said, I just need to figure out how to make money off of off of my skill set. Um, and so give yourself the freedom to enjoy the process of being an entrepreneur in your early stages um, and have a nest egg to fall back on when you yeah, make somewhere that along the lines, to do this people, full-time. People thought like the the only option was to like burn all the boats and like go all yeah. in. And, and I think that's just like that hustle culture mentality. And it's like, that pressure, you use the word pressure and it's the best word to use, has caused more businesses to fail than I can count. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I'd say it's num- uh, all listen. those uh, Netflix documentaries on all the uh, Silicon Valley startups where they have the story of the. I used to work at WeWork. So if y'all watched any of the WeWork documentaries, oh, like, interesting. I, I watched them all. <laughs> oh, I'm gosh. a sucker for documentaries. Yeah. I yeah. They're so all. interesting. And I feel yeah. like sometimes those kind of documentaries like lead entrepreneurs down a bad thought process because like they're showing these big companies that did go all in, but how many companies went all in and failed? Yeah. It's survivorship bias. I, t- I tell people this all the time survivorship yeah. bias and some and there's some luck in there right like just good For timing sure. yeah um you know I, I think we i think a lot of people we don't like to admit that luck plays a role but it does um you just made me think of something that i want to dive into before we log off here um the silicon valley thing kind of made me think of this of like low ticket versus high ticket because a lot of people a lot of companies that can go low ticket and be successful have a lot of cash to burn. This is where like Silicon Valley kind of mm-hmm. made me think of this. It's like they have a lot of like uh, capital to burn for a very long, long time where they're not profitable. And that's why they're able to get away with being like the low cost solution. Yep. I'm not saying it has to be that way. And, and, and I'm kind of stretching the parallels here. It just made me think of it. Low ticket versus high ticket pricing. And so I want to dive into that, especially in the terms of like online coaching i think it's really hard to do low ticket probably for an in-person studio just because um there's so much overhead but because there's no overhead in an online business you can obviously entertain it so i would love to hear your cfo mindset on low ticket versus high ticket and like maybe win it yeah it's just i'd love to hear it yeah of course so going back to the owner's pay roadmap so after we figure out how much you need to make in your life Uh, We then take it a step further and have you map out what is your ideal work situation? How many hours are you spending so we can get some sort of baseline price for how we need to price your time? And so we I use that a lot in in coaching. So just for easy numbers of conversation, say the math works out and you need to charge one hundred dollars per hour of your time to hit all these goals that you have. Um, So it's like first how can we create a high ticket offer based on that rate to get you to where you need to be? And in my opinion, in the coaching world, it's way easier to create one-on-one opportunities in the beginning than to do group. 
Like figure out your one-on-one opportunities. Your one-on-one opportunities should be high ticket because they're paying for your personal time. So when I think about the differences, a couple of things that I like to consider is how much of the coach's time is given to uh, the client, the customer. Is it in a one-on-one capacity or a group capacity? Once you get to the group, you can get lower tickets, but they're still uh, you're still showing up. So it's still your time that's being traded for money. Um, so I kind of see it in like three tiers. You have like high ticket for one-on-one, medium tier for group program, and then low tier would be, you know, your eBooks and um, those type of uh, more like passive revenue streams where you're not trading time for money. You're just trading your marketing efforts for for that. So I would consider how much time are you spending with your customer? Um, and then what is that magic hourly rate that you need to hit in order to hit all of your goals? And that number should drive all of your decisions. So if that number is $100 an hour and you're only charging $55 for your personal training session, then that's why you're not hitting your goals because you're only charging 55 and the math is the math, which is why I love numbers. They're so black and white for the most part. Um, so how do we get you from $55 per session to hundred dollars per session? Um, and it can, we can go in stages. So it depends like where you're at in your process of your sales journey. How confident do you feel in selling? How many client testimonials and client um, transformations have you received have you gotten um, and that will help drive the decision for how fast we can increase you to that hundred dollars an hour I have some clients that are like okay great the next client I'm going to charge a hundred dollars and see what happens on a sales call I'm like yeah just see what happens if they say no then we know that's too high or we need to adjust how you're selling and sometimes they're like oh shit Lauren I just sold I just sold this for a hundred dollars an hour and I was like yeah you did and so yeah, a lot of it is sometimes... just like the confidence that they that you need to gain confidence in being able to sell for a higher ticket. Yeah, sometimes even with like a newer business owner, I'll just I'll say start low, and then after like your first three to five, mm-hmm. bump it, and then yep. bump it again. Just keep bumping and then bump it. Bump it yep. again. You know what I mean? Because yep. I understand like the the scarcity and the need for some money early on. So okay, undercharge a little bit, get some experience, refine your offer, um, just kind of learn how it's going to work and then bump it up and then bump it up. And then it's a lot easier when you do it that way. Yeah. So when you're early in your business and you want to charge that low ticket, you want to still have the illusion and in your mind that you're going to charge the hundred dollars an hour. So what I like to do, if you have Mm. to charge below what you're doing, call it beta testing for your new program. And like, that's why you're giving a discount is because they're and like, they know that they are the guinea pigs. And they're helping you refine your program. And people want to help you. They want to give you your opinion on what you're doing with them. So not only are you uh, temporarily discounting your offer, but you're also using that relationship to get feedback so you can quickly implement it and charge that $100 an hour faster uh, so you can hit your goals. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense too. And it also kind of tells them like, you know, if they're referring someone to you of like, hey, that this is not going to be the permanent price. Uh, right. Because sometimes right. That, that can be an issue. So, no, that's a, that's a really great point. Lauren, I appreciate you coming on, talking numbers with me. Um, I always yeah, enjoy Lauren. having these conversations. I like to, to think about the business finances as a very scientific number. Um, and then once you start diving into the cash flow, I'm like, yeah, then like the science is all out the window. It's all emotions at that point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's always fun to dive into the science of the numbers with, with a fellow money nerd. And I uh, appreciate you coming on. Let everyone know where they can find you on social media, um, learn more about you. And if you have anything coming up that you want them to check out. Yeah, thank you. So you can find us at activecoreconsulting.com. Uh, uh, Instagram at Active Core Consulting. Um, the link in the show notes will be activecoreconsulting.com slash podcast. We have a couple of freebies um, that we're going to give you guys. One is on CEO mindset and the other one is a calculator to go through what we talked about earlier of understanding your expenses as a percentage of revenue and where you might have some areas that you can look in your business to refine. So that'll be just a good like gut check, especially as we're going into the new year and everybody's reassessing what they're spending their money on. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you.